Thank you, Reed. Thank you, Chairperson, for the kind introduction, and thank you for inviting me uh, through the uh, Irish Family Planning Association. Uh, so I'm going to really talk from what the uh, uh, Chairperson meant about the reports being uh, released at 11 o'clock today. And looking at the report, I had uh, permission to show two slides, uh, with your kind permission, and to see what does it really mean in a clinical perspective, what should clinicians really think about it, and uh, as public, as uh, members of parliament or lawyers and other profession, how, how should we approach this problem uh, based on the views of the Citizens Bureau. This is actually the results of the Citizens Assembly vote, um, the reasons for which abortion should be lawful in Ireland. Now this result is not uh, that different when you do the surveys in different countries. As you could see, if it is threat to life, then uh, all would, almost all would support uh, abortion being carried out. And I was mentioned about Savita, for example, that would be a typical example where it should have been done. Yet there is one uh, vote probably saying they don't agree to that. Uh, so the woman is going to die, but I don't agree of having an abortion because the woman is going to die. That's it might be not because they don't really believe in it, but because they're not 100% certain. How do you really make the diagnosis that this woman is going to die? Because sometimes that is difficult, and that might be the reason. And the same will apply to the other things. Uh, the threat of suicide, it goes up a little bit, and if it is a, a, a serious physical risk, yeah, more people are not very keen about having an abortion and so on. So if you look at this graph, uh, as it goes up, increasingly more and more people are uncomfortable when it comes to lighter and lighter decisions. But So I'm going to really see, um, is it really um, because uh, we haven't understood the whole picture or should we really uh, look at each in individual item separately? The, the next issue is actually to do with um, at what gestation uh, would this um, would, be, would you be comfortable to allow termination in these different reasons? And as you could see, the, the red bar remains the same because you have decided uh, you're not going to permit termination at, for, uh, for whatever reason given at the bottom uh, columns. But then in terms of uh, uh, some, of course, are not sure about whether termination, at what gestation they should allow termination. But the dark bar says that uh, at any gestation and the lighter one up to 22 weeks, um, or 20 weeks, and the, the light shade is the one which uh, they say must be up to 12 weeks. Now there are some difficulties about that because, uh, for example, there are fetal anomalies which are lethal, like uh, a severe cardiac or severe anencephaly or something, which cannot be diagnosed early. Uh, so sometimes it might not be easy to really uh, say that you had to terminate it 12 weeks or 14 weeks because things are picked up later on. Uh, and similarly, if a woman has a tendency for suicide, um, you don't know what gestation it is going to arise. It doesn't start at 10 weeks or 12 weeks. It might be at 14 weeks. So what do we do with that? Uh, Sometimes there have been cases of cancer which is diagnosed and they need therapy and they need termination before they go for the therapy. Where do we stand in that? So there are some intricacies about that and I can understand why a small proportion has said uh, to limit it below 12 weeks. Uh, whereas the others have said uh, it can be done up to 20 weeks. And so I'm going to develop the medical arguments and the human rights argument. How do we really look at these uh, different viewpoints? Now, the key questions I'm going to address is what is the healthcare rationale for providing legal abortion services? Uh, what are the human rights standards that must inform any uh, future abortion law in Ireland? And finally, what policies must be in place to ensure good reproductive health care in Ireland. That is based on international standards uh, like the WHO and the FIGO. Now to start with actually we'll address the first question. What is the health care rationale for providing legal abortion services? Uh, first abortion from this is actually from the FIGO Committee on Ethical Aspects of Human Reproduction. This is a group of human rights lawyers, obstetricians and so on who get together from time to time to discuss uh, different questions which are uh, not easy to answer on ethical, moral or legal principles. So they had to really come to some conclusion. 
and this is what they say based on existing UN convention. Uh, abortion for medical indication, that is risk to health and life, is considered as part of good reproductive health care in almost all countries. So whenever it comes to serious illness or life, then it is uh, something. Now the second category is non-medical reasons. Abortion for non-medical reasons, Figo considers that providing the process of properly informed consent has been carried out, a woman's right to autonomy combined with the need to prevent unsafe abortion justifies the profession of safe abortion. This is because of a very intricate issue looking at it globally. Uh, when we don't permit legal abortion, there is a tendency to go and get illegal abortion done, which has high incidence of morbidity and deaths. So that is why that provision is given. Now Ireland is a very special case because in Ireland, illegal abortion doesn't take place like any other country because they go and get safe abortion done in England or Denmark or something. So that problem hasn't surfaced. I don't know what will happen after Brexit, uh, but that is the issue at the moment. Now, I'm from Sri Lanka, and I know 15% of gynecological admissions to the gynecology ward is because of complications of illegal abortion, and 15% of maternal deaths is due to illegal abortion. So if in Ireland, if nothing can be provided outside the shows, and if illegal abortion becomes an issue, then the same consequences might be faced. So when FIGO recommends that, it is looking at that particular concept, saying that for non-medical reasons, you want to avoid uh, illegal abortion or unsafe abortion, and therefore, as long as a woman understands the issue, then it can be justified. Now it continues, most people, including physicians, prefer to avoid termination of pregnancy, and it is with regret that they may judge it to be the best course, because no physician likes to sit in one place and keep on doing abortion. They try to avoid it, and many people, they say they have a conscientious objection because they don't like to do it. But if you look at the woman's circumstances, she's made to act like a criminal because not only she is having a mental issue of uh, agony, of having through, going through abortion, the physical issue, the emotional issues, the financial issues, so many things come in. So we had to really look at this issue uh, more compassionately. And so the committee recommended that after appropriate counseling, a woman has the right to have access to medical or surgical induced abortion. And uh, that the healthcare services has an obligation to provide such services as safely as possible. Now, if we carry on, the WHO, which is the World Health Organization, has also joined FIGO and uh, they favor greater access to safe abortion services because unsafe abortion causes suffering and deaths. And I'll show you the figures of the morbidity of uh, what happens if it is unsafe abortion. And criminalization of abortion only increases mortality without decreasing the incidence of induced abortions. And I'll give you some examples. And decriminalization dramatically reduces mortality. And there are neighboring countries here which has shown that very clearly and decriminalization does not increase the abortion rate. So let us look at what I'm saying now in this particular slide. Now when I said that suffering, it's not only a woman after abortion, she's okay, but if she's done in an unsafe manner, they can get complications like hemorrhage, sepsis, peritonitis, trauma to the cervix, vagina, or uterus, uh, secondary infertility, all these complications can happen. Now looking at global figures, uh, annual number of women admitted to hospitals after unsafe abortion is in the range of 5 million. So you can see the enormous number of women who are undergoing this problem of either having hemorrhage, sepsis, peritonitis, and so on is 5 million. And if you look at the loss of productive years of life, that comes to nearly 2 million. So in fact, because they had to travel, they had to have, and if they are complications, they are more unable to do the work. So that is the problem. Now. This is actually to look at criminalization abortion, the second aspect. This is taking a country, um, Romania, in 1966, they introduced the uh, restrictive abortion and make it criminalized. And as soon as it is done, the number of uh, abortion-related morbidity and mortality started going up. Because what was done legally, the moment you say you can't do it legally, then the women go and get it done in the some um, clandestine place and they use 
uh, anti uh, uh, they don't follow the aseptic antiseptic principles they put in sticks or something which are not sterile and they do all sorts of things and as a result the morbidity and mortality goes up now in South Africa just the opposite happens they uh, decriminalize the abortion issue and pre-legislative uh, before 1994 there were 528 five deaths from unsafe abortion in public hospitals each year. In 1996, they brought in the Choice and Termination of Pregnancy Act, and post legislation from 1998 to 2001, there were only 36 abortion related deaths. Now, these 36, when you go into the depths, they were not done in the hospitals. They, despite the abortion law being liberalized, if a woman is living in a small village because she didn't have access, she went into a quack practitioner and got it done and as a result she died of hemorrhage or abortion. So nevertheless by introducing it, it has been reduced. So the result is actually 91% decrease in deaths for, uh, from unsafe abortion. So decriminalization will bring the death and the morbidity rate down quite considerably. Now what about is it going to increase the abortion rate by uh, decriminalizing abortion? The answer is no. This is from France. The moment they said uh, they were decriminalized, the abortion rates came down. It's not only France, if you take uh, Italy as another example, that also came down. And uh, in uh, Turkey, this also came down. Then you might ask the question, why did it come down? Here I'm saying, come for abortion, and it is going down. It is because they also had to put into place post-abortion contraception. If they go to a clandestine place, and have an abortion done, nothing else is done. Or if they get it through the post, nothing else is done. Whereas if we legalize abortion, then the counseling should always include contraception because the vast majority, as Katrina was saying, were married mothers who are in their 20s and 30s who are children. So they want to limit the family, so you offer them a long-acting reversible contraceptive like an intrauterine device or an implant or pills or whatever you want to whatever is acceptable to them, and then you give it. And that is the reason why it comes down. So if you want to really reduce abortion, it is not by making it legal, but trying to give contraception at the outset, emergency contraception, post-abortion contraception, post-delivery contraception. Now, we Figo is doing a project on soon after the baby is born and the placenta is out, putting an intrauterine device, because the women don't come back in many of these countries for another service. So they will have these uh, services done. So the experience in different countries shows by liberalizing abortion, you don't increase abortion, but you decrease because of good post-abortion contraceptive services. So the public health imperative is very clear. The abortions and the high maternal and child mortality rate constitute a serious public health problem in many countries. And uh, the World Health Assembly in 1967 proclaimed that things had to be made differently. And unsafe abortions threaten the lives of a large number of women, representing a grave public health problem. And the United Nations uh, in 1995 declared that actions has to be taken by governments in collaboration with NGOs and employers and workers organizations and with the support of international institutions, recognize and deal with the health impact of unsafe abortion as a major public health concern. So we go to the second question. What are the human rights standards that must inform any future abortion law in uh, Ireland? Now, as we know, in 1948, there was a universal declaration of health uh, human rights. And it says the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health is one of the fundamental rights of every human being without distinction of race, religion, political belief, economic or social condition. Now, in the same constitution, they also defined health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So that was a broader issue. But then it came to the issue about sexual and reproductive rights. So in the International Conference of the UN in Tehran in 1968, they developed separate codes or reproductive rights as subject of human rights. So there's a broader human rights principle, but what are the reproductive rights we are talking about? Now this was also monitored by Committee of Elimination or Discrimination Against Women, and there were a number of conferences. One was in Cairo in 1995, famously called as ICPD, 
is uh, UN International Conference on Population and Development. Then it was followed in the conference, uh, UN Conference on Women in Beijing in 1995. In that declaration, it's not only health issues were discussed, but also the other issues. And there was a famous phrase used, uh, global 50-50 by 2030. That is, women should have equal parity on all aspects by 2030. So you can imagine they have put 35 years to achieve that. That's a a long time and now the SDG or the Sustainable Development Goals also the same same thing. So the human right treaties um, subsequent to this particular conference and UN treaty monitoring bodies and regional national courts have increasingly paid attention to this about how do we really give sexual and reproductive rights for women and this is uh, subsequently in 2011 and it's the UN Special Rapporteur on health says the criminal law penalizing and restricting induced abortion are the paradigmatic examples of impermissible barriers <coughs> to realization of women's right to health and must be eliminated. And these laws infringe women's dignity and autonomy by severely restricting decision making by women in respect of their sexual and reproductive health. And it goes on and says certain criminal laws effectively shift the burden of realizing the right of health away from states onto pregnant women. So they are shifting by punishing women for the lack of effective provision of health, uh, goods, services, and education by the government. So in other words, if you want to really look at abortion, it's not just abortion, but also sexual and reproductive health, education from very young, provision of contraception at every stage, uh, primary prevention of contraception, secondary prevention when there is unexpected sexual intercourse by emergency contraception, tertiary prevention, post-abortion or post-delivery contraception. All this has to be built in. Now, if you take uh, the human rights and subdivide them into right to life, right to health, right to equality and non-discrimination, right to be free from cruel and inhumane and degrading treatment, rights to liberty, security of person and privacy, and rights to information and education. Now, these are the rights of the individual in terms of health. Now, if you go back to the Citizens Bureau voting, you would have seen that certain columns were a little bit more red. But if you, for example, apply uh, for a woman who has an anencephalic fetus, who is 18 weeks or so, and then you can put it under rights to be free from cruel, inhumane, and degrading treatment. How can she carry an anencephalic fetus all around the workplace and everybody asking how is your pregnancy going and she's crying because uh, she has no way of terminating and so should we allow termination at 18 weeks because of that or you can take a, a girl who has got raped and then uh, she is uh, carrying a pregnancy and uh, she has the rights to liberty security of person and privacy so she can't be carrying and saying oh so who is your partner no, I got raped so these are issues which has to be taken into consideration. Now, it is not easy to tease out things, but I think it's quite important for us to understand these issues. Now, this is the latest in 2016 on UN Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. Preventing unintended pregnancies and unsafe abortion requires states to liberalize restrictive abortion laws, guarantee access to safe abortion services, and quality post-abortion care and respect women's right to make autonomous decisions about their sexual and reproductive health. So that is very clear, and that was what was stated earlier. It is stated again. Elimination of discrimination requires states to repeal or reform laws and policies that impair people's ability to realize their right to sexual and reproductive health. For example, criminalization of abortions or restrictive abortion laws. And states should aim to ensure universal access to a full range of quality sexual and reproductive health care, including safe abortion care. So over the years, nothing has changed, but they are emphasizing more and more and more the need for the rights. And this is actually about, uh, in order to end the discrimination against women, it states, recognize women's right to be free from unwanted pregnancies, ensure access to affordable and effective family planning services, Noting that many countries where women have the right to abortion on request, supported by the affordable and effective family planning measures, have the lowest abortion rates in the world. States should allow women to terminate a pregnancy on request during the first trimester or later in the specific cases listed above. I'll show you later on why this first trimester issue has come in in this particular issue. 
Now, key question three is what policies must be in place to ensure good reproductive health care in Ireland? So, as a clinician or a health care department, health care executive, what should I do? That is, what is required is a better understanding of how to provide safe abortion and to make clear that he's not promoting abortion and there will not be less abortion if women are punished. Recognize that the fetus exists and has a moral value, so you don't indiscriminately promote, carefully listen and counsel, to establish clear limits of gestational age, establish the conditions when abortion is permitted, and promote interventions with proven capacity to reduce abortion, which I mentioned about the different stages of contraception. Now, most of it is given in this book, which is the Safe Abortion Guidelines, Technical and Policy Guidance for Health Systems. This is produced by the World Health Organization, and similar guidelines exist for the Royal College of Obstetricians in the UK. You can get it, download it from the net, from the WHO. If you say Safe Abortion Guidelines, WHO, you can download. This has evidence-based best practices for providing safe abortion care in order to protect the health of women. Now, there's a long list of things, so I'm going to rush through just uh, looking at only the title. It says how the organization should be uh, done, constellation of services. So if it is uh, so much of population, so much of land, how many clinics do you need? Do you need everywhere? How do you really organize the services? Second, evidence-based standards and guidelines including types of abortion services, where and by whom they can be provided, the methods of abortion, certification and licensing of healthcare professional and facilities. So you can't do it everywhere and uh, every, everybody cannot do it. So you had to really restrict it so that the procedure is safe and the women are safe. Referral mechanisms, respect of women's informed and voluntary decision making and confidentiality and privacy is quite important. It goes on to say, that uh, there should be informed and voluntary decision making. You must avoid third party authorization to ask, go and get another doctor to sign or somebody else to certify. And protection of persons with special needs because some of them can't explain themselves. Confidentiality and privacy and special provision for who have suffered rape. So these are, and also provision if the doctors have conscientious objection, what do you do? How do you really overcome that uh, barrier? And uh, the next part of it deals with equipping facilities about uh, essential equipment, medication and supplies, regulatory requirements, um, the provider skills and performance, uh, training programs and so on. So all this is given. There's nothing new because this is based on experience of the World Health Organizations in different countries. And it is not only good enough to provide the services, there should be monitoring and evaluation how is it going? How many cases did we see? What was the complication? Where were the complications? Was it in one place, different places? And what is it due to? Is it due to poor instruments, poor medication, or poor training? And quality insurance and quality improvement should be the game. The last several years, there was not a single maternal death due to abortion in England, Wales, uh, because the regulations are there, people are trained, and they know how to do it. And secondly, nearly 80 to 90 percent are becoming medical abortions by medication, not by surgical uh, type of abortion, so it's much safer. Financing has to be thought about, uh, of cost to the health facility, and making services affordable to the women. And uh, managing safe abortion care includes assessing the current situation, what are, where are the hospitals, etc., and introducing the intervention to strengthen abortion care and scaling up policies with programmatic you know, interventions. And you have to create an enabling environment, and that is uh, where uh, the crucial thing about lack of, of access to information is one of the major barriers, uh, restricting the type of healthcare providers giving, because in some, if it is just a prescription, a nurse prescriber can be asked to do that after checking. Uh, mandatory waiting period should be avoided, because that is a barrier. And restrictive interpretation of laws and abortion has also to be avoided, so it has to be very clear. So the barriers can be social, uh, cultural, and gender norms might uh, impinge into that, legal restrictions, and service norms like third-party authorization, waiting time, type of providers, methods, and so on. And lack of information resources and transport <coughs> and support is quite important. So this is a long road, as you could see, uh, for a woman to travel, and I think there's some light at the end of it, so we don't know. That is, you have to decide whether there's going to be some light at the end of it. 
And this is actually the legislature building here. So you have to decide what is going to happen in the future for women's health in Ireland. I would like to give some very important points here. Now this is actually looking at case fatality rates of legally induced abortion, um, spontaneous abortions or term deliveries in 100,000 procedures. Now in the UK there are four clauses under which termination is done. One is actually continuation of pregnancy means ill health or death to the woman. And that is very true because if a woman continues in pregnancy she has chance of developing preeclampsia and convulsions of postpartum hemorrhage and dying. That's 10 per 100,000 in the United States. On the other hand, if she has a uh, surgical abortion, which is under nine weeks, is 0.1. And if it is up to 10 weeks, it's 0.2. So if you take in realistic term, is if it is uh, two per million here, that is 100 per million. So continuing our pregnancy is a risk. It's not something which you can say it is without a risk. But doing an abortion early, earlier you do the abortion, the better it is because you uh, reduce the risk. And this is n not only the United States, but also in other world um, experiences the same. So it is quite crucial. And if you look at the barrier here, it starts going up beyond the 20 weeks margin. Before that, it seems to be very low. This is a map of Europe to show where Ireland is and uh, Poland is, uh, two distinct, and Cyprus, that's the third, compared to the rest of the European world. So where there is no legislation or restrictive laws for women's sexual and reproductive health. So the question is actually, it's left whether we should join the rest of Europe. Yes, we are joined. Uh, of course, England has left now. I don't know what is going to happen, but Ireland, you are in it, and that is your decision. I would like to finish with a couple of quotes. This is a friend of mine, Jack, John Jack Shearer from Chicago, and he says, no law that has ever been passed and no law that ever will ever be passed can prevent a determined woman from trying to end an unwanted pregnancy. Society and hospitals must accept their role in keeping women safe in that process. Essentially, he says, abortion is to do with safety. And I have just added one, one of my favorite quotes here. It says, when people ask me, you are a pro-abortionist, I said, yes, I'm a pro-legal abortionist, and you are pro-illegal abortionist. Because if you don't support legal abortion, you're promoting women to go into illegal abortion. So I said, both of us are abortionists. You are, I am legal, but you are illegal. You are promoting illegal abortion. So that's my quote, because I don't want to be called an abortionist. I'm not for it, but I'm saying you have to think about safety and the rights of the women. That's what is most crucial. So in concluding, I would say good reproductive health should be viewed as a public health concern, which apart from the provision of safe and high quality abortion care, must include sex and relationship education in the national school curriculum and access to family planning that I'm stressing again and again and contraception services. So hopefully, let us join the rest of Europe and the majority of countries in the world to provide the sexual and reproductive health and rights for women in Ireland, which is their human rights. Thank you very much indeed.